From new product development to teardown benchmarking, Monroe offers comprehensive solutions. We specialize in reducing costs and weight, drawing from 35 years of experience to help you maximize profitability and elevate your projects. Contact Monroe and Associates today, and let's turn your next project into a success story. Monroe, innovation starts here. Hey everybody, um, we're back again. <clears throat> now we've got the box off, or the bed, some people want to call it the bed. I think that might be too provocative for uh, today's, in, uh, in today's language, but anyways, box, bed, it's off. So now what we can do is have a look at what we couldn't see before, which is the rear motor um, and the rear inverter. Uh, some of the most massive uh, cast, or weldments I've seen in forever. And, uh, but we're going to kick it off uh, with Paul telling us a little bit about um, how you can uh, do things smarter if you think about them earlier. So, um, yeah, Paul, let's, let's start yours. with uh, some good news. Uh, uh, one of the things we do like about this is a real compact rear drive unit, um, and they package it underneath the, the bed. Um, so power electronics for the inverter are, is mounted right on top. Um, drive unit below, it's water cooled, so they don't have to be plumbing the oil back here. Um, so a nice compact unit mounted uh, in this subframe. Um, so that's nice, like to see it. The one thing that caught my eye um, about this though, was this little ground strap. Um, it's bolted here up against a uh, painted surface, so the, the grounding takes place through the bolt, um, which is not ideal, and that's the kind of thing that we see when the ground strap was added late in the program. I'm not sure, I wasn't there when they did this, but um, I kind of suspect that might be the case. And there, there's a reason why they had to ground the the housing of the motor to this frame rail. Um, because when you look at the, the way the system is architected, they've got these big high voltage cables that I pointed out before, the one going down that frame rail and one going down this frame rail, um, that forms almost a complete loop. And when you form a loop like that, then all the current that's flowing through these cables can produce electromagnetic noise um, that gets, turns this whole thing into a broadcast station, uh, broadcasting the switching noise of the motor um, into all of the systems in the vehicle. And so I'm sure they were having trouble with electromagnetic interference. And so they added this ground strap and all the electromagnetic interference goes away. That's good. But the problem is that it goes away because now they have this ground loop with current in it. The current cancels the electromagnetic interference. But if you're driving current in a ground loop, the energy for that has to come from somewhere. And in this case, it mostly comes from the battery or the fuel tank through via the, the generator. And so this is just a mystery loss that is in their vehicle that's reducing their fuel economy or electric range. So they could have done better if they had located all of the, um, the high voltage DC power lines down one frame rail. So they're all in line and they don't form a large loop. And then they wouldn't have needed this ground strap at the late program. So this is something that we'd like to help with as uh, programs are in the early stages once you get to the point where you've built your first prototype, it's really hard to find the space claim to move something as big as like uh, a big DC cable like that. This and is, so they were stuck. This is really, you know, an instance where you have additional cost and a loss in efficiency, right? And so really yeah. you have to look yeah. at the architecture from the beginning phases of the project. And usually we don't even see high voltage running back, right? So it'll be one thing to run it back, but at least 
co-located with, so you don't have a loop, but usually right. you don't even see this at all, right? So yeah. from so a very early perspective. Not like, talking about big currents or you know, nothing dangerous and the losses are small, but they're just one of those little things that they could have um, not had to deal with if they um, changed the architecture from the beginning. Well, at the end of the day, Monroe Associates, what we do is new product development. And quite frankly, before we even start putting pencil to paper or start creating pixels, uh, we're going to probably have a few things in our spec that says, don't do this, don't do that. And this is one of the don't do's. And that is another big giant don't do. I, I don't quite understand. And by the way, there is an issue that can happen when you have something like this, when you're running a ground strap through these little uh, contactors here, these little bolts, um, they might start to frost over or corrode. If this thing falls off or is somehow damaged, that loop that we talked about, that's right back where it was. And now you can have some of the, um, uh, some of the um, a little, um, uh, the kind of gremlins, right? Yeah, and you can have go. these things starting to do crosstalk and things, yeah. and, or in some cases, they just won't work at all. Right. So this, to me, this is a really big problem. Um, I, I don't, if you, we do something called um, uh, failure modes and effects analysis. This would be a giant red uh, one, and it would be right at the top of the heap. I would never... Um, I guess if, you, if you've got the whole car all done and you got no other choice, maybe you could do this, but I'd be scraping the shit out of, um, out of this material here and I would be making sure that this thing would never break. Now it's braided and stuff like that and that's great, but at the end of the day, I don't like that at all. But it's one of many things I don't like. So we've talked about, um, we've talked about some of the good things and there are not very many of them, but I think it's time we started looking at these massive weldments. Um, and I, I have never, I've worked on trucks in forever. I mean, trucks, tanks, um, armored cars, all kinds of stuff. I've never seen anything like this. And like I said before, I think this is, wait a minute. I think this is a, is a, is a Trojan horse, but it could be something else. It could be that this, this is too big for this vehicle. I'm wondering if this could be something where I remove all the cross car beams and I use these for my longitudinals and now I'm creating something like a 350 or something like an F350 or whatever. Maybe it's commonality for another program. Well, uh, I, I could get rid of that, these, that would change, these would change. Uh, this would get cut here and s expanded. If this was a 350 even, it's still, it's still uh, overdone. But maybe, maybe this is like, maybe this is a design that's going to be modified. If it isn't, then this is really goofy. Mm -hmm. uh, I, uh, I, I just can't, I can't begin to tell you how much, uh, how, how incredibly um um yeah I'm, I'm trying to think of immature is the only word i can think of yeah how immature this this frame is i mean i think part i of was expecting why, much much better why it looks so substantial is their um architectural decision for the rear suspension here right so there's a independent suspension so they needed all the pickup points for the upper and lower arms which they um do by increasing uh, essentially your section of the rails in the rear here, right? So if you just look at these geometries here, they actually remind me a lot of what you'd see in unibody construction, right? This surfacing here where we um, integrate our mount for our dampener and spring seat underneath um, our rails here in a usual truck. Usually that'd be um, just a relatively straight rail that looks a lot more like these longitudinal notes here because you have uh, a straight axle, right, which is leaf springs that tie to uh, the longitudinals. 
Um, RAM has a similar layout to this. It's a five link, but uh, it still is more reminiscent of uh, regular uh, truck frames. Um, and if you look here, um, we have these very interesting suspension components, right? So essentially we have one upper A-arm and on the bottom we're sort of forming a triangle with uh, a lateral spring link and what looks to be what you could call a trailing arm, right? So that's forming the lower triangle. The trailing arm will take the um, 4F forces, and, uh, but it really does look different. That's essentially what it does functionally. And you categorize it as a trailing plus spring link plus upper suspension, but quite unusual and I, um, not, not very American at all. No, I think that if we looked at how to redesign that, all you have to do is look at the lightning scrap all those uh, there's two great big massive um, uh, weld vents down there get rid of those and put in uh, the big casting that Ford went with uh, one casting that I'm positive will do a better job than what that is I don't even I've never seen one like that before uh, my brain just looks at it and doesn't uh, I can't see any good reason for making uh, making anything look like that this just kind of looks like Again, back to immature. I don't, I don't understand why they did this. Maybe they got really bad if he, uh, finite element analysis programs. I don't know, but this, this is like hugely overdone. Check this out, Sandy. So here they have the subframe that they're using to mount yeah. the, um, the suspension as well as your EDU, but this is welded in, right? So you see yeah. this is welded right. in here to the cross member to the frame, yeah. but then here they're bolting in another component, right? To brace this off. Why Whatever is that? For. Why is that? Um, Wait a minute, is this, maybe yeah. this is welded at assembly? You bolt it and weld. I used to do that kind of stuff on machine tools, bolt and weld at assembly. So you bolt it in place so that you can weld it without having, uh, having the thing distort. But yeah, looking but at this side, they're this doesn't it. do it. It doesn't do anything. They're dipping it after, right? So if, yeah. you, if you bolted it and did the welding, then yeah, you'd see then dip the bolts on the bolts. Be, yeah. So, I mean, that'd be clever. That might be a nice assembly aid, but it doesn't look like that's what they did here. Is this maybe um, belt and suspenders then? So they put it on, and maybe then we went through testing, and the, and the frame still broke, and then they put the bolts on? with, Because this bracket was obviously welded in place a long time ago. Is that what they did there for? I don't know. I mean, it could be this, this monument here is really just the pickup point for the upper control arm for the rear bushing. Maybe this wasn't there in design and they found that they need a little bit more support and this could be just another band-aid similar to our ground strap, right? Where so, this was never designed to be yeah. there at all. So maybe what they could have done was taken this bracket, extended it a little bit, welded it, and it'd be done. That's all Monroe do it. Yes. Well, no, Monroe wouldn't do well, anything <laughs> like this. Okay. Nothing. Right, zero. <laughs> yeah. So uh, don't get me going. <laughs> yeah. So at the end of the day, everything here uh, doesn't look good. Um, maybe they did this with an outside supplier. I don't know. Uh, but this BYD really makes good stuff as a rule. And I was really looking forward to seeing something either evolutionary, better than what we've seen in the past, has, or revolutionary in this. This doesn't do it for me at all. Is this the first truck for BYD? I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. I don't know. I, no, because they have buses and big trucks all over the place. Yes. This is not, this is not a first. And their buses are quite, quite well done. I, I'm, but this, holy mackerel. Uh, if you get a chance to get a close-up of the, the label, uh, the, From the, other side. the type of approval yes. requirements uh, have them putting a lot of good information on the label. And I think some of our viewers will like to see 150 kilowatt motor and uh, what that, uh, the label has to tell us. I'm hoping that what's underneath there is going to be a lot more revolutionary than, um, than what this is, I mean, it just looks like, to me, it looks like it was made for a military in, in, in 1945. And it just looks like before they had um, really the software tool, well, they didn't have any software, but this is, looks like it was made when um, 
you know, you did this to find out whether or not you had the right thicknesses for materials. Because everything here is at least a millimeter thick. And some places what I've been gauging with my, my magic fingers here, two, two millimeters and two and a half millimeters, holy crap. I, I don't see any, I don't see a rationale or reason for any of this. Unless, like I say, it's a millet. Here you go. There's three. Um, I I, uh, I don't see any uh, I don't see any value in all this extra weight and welding, especially holy mackerel. This uh, we try to get away from arc welding. I will tell you, the arc welding is really well done, but uh, I, I uh, this would not be something that uh, Monroe would be uh, recommending to our customers ever. So, anyhow, that's a sad way to end, but um, anybody uh, got any uplifting uh, words of wisdom here? No, sorry. Yeah. I don't either. Anyhow, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, have a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. <laughs> and uh, we're all done here. <laughs> bye Thank now. you, everyone. Thanks a lot. Yeah, bye bye. bye, -bye.